Welcome to the Everybody Matters podcast. This show is an outreach of Barry Waymiller. Don't forget to connect with us on the web at barrywaymiller.com, on Twitter at Barry Waymiller, on Facebook and LinkedIn, and check out our blog, trulyhumanleadership.com. I'm Brent Stewart, your host. As we continue to navigate these extraordinary times and look to the future, there is a lot of uncertainty around business and the economy. Many companies are asking how they move forward as they begin to rebuild despite not knowing what's around the corner. But maybe this time we do it differently. Maybe this time it's time to think bigger. Maybe it's time to make sure as you rebuild your business to devote it to a higher purpose. But what does that mean? Well, it's a matter of having a purpose for your business that looks beyond just creating wealth and increasing shareholder value. But how does that impact the day-to-day, the economics of the business, and the people within your business? Why is it important? Well, here's Bob Quinn, a professor emeritus at the University of Michigan's Ross Business School and a co-founder of the Center for Positive Organizations to explain. In the transactional mindset that dominates business, when some CEO feels the social pressure, which is now common, to have organizational purpose, they put it on their to-do list, they form a task force, and after a few months they check it off as done, and it goes on the wall. And when you say to the woman in the cafeteria who's checking out the lunches, hey, what is that on the wall? She rolls her eyes. That is, when people implement a statement of higher purpose, they're doing positive harm to their organization. They're making the people more cynical than they already are. That's really important to think about. So why would you do higher purpose? One CEO said, I'm not going to do higher purpose because you know, we're just going to put it on the wall and then we're going to ignore it. We're going to be hypocrites. So I'm not doing it. And one of his people said, well, what if we did it and then we lived it? What if we weren't hypocrites? And that led to this incredible discussion in which they went after higher purpose authentically. Now, what does it mean to be authentic? It means that the statement of higher purpose is the arbiter of every decision. That means everybody in the organization becomes powerful. I was at a company in Ohio. We were having a discussion. This mid-level woman said, my boss just said we're going to do X, Y, Z. And I told him no. Now every head flipped and looked at her. She said, I said, that's not consistent with our purpose. And the boss's response, oh, yeah, you're right. Now the CEO at that moment looked at me and he said, that's what I'm saying. When purpose is the arbiter of every decision, every single person's empowered. The average manager, executive, operating from normal transactional theory that we've learned since we were born, knows that's impossible. So when we talk about higher purpose, we're talking about a phenomenon outside conventional thinking. And part of that is authenticity. We don't believe in authenticity in business. We don't tell each other the truth. We are on stage. I'm running my agenda, you're running yours, and the smartest person wins. When someone talks authentically in a company, we're shocked. The single most frequent question I'm asked is, what if you have a boss like this? What if the people up there don't believe in any of these things? What if your employees are nasty union members? That is, we can't do it because none of these people believe in it. Therefore, I'm helpless. End of story. Now that raises a whole series of possibilities. (laughs) Number one, am I a better person than I was yesterday? Am I a better leader than I was yesterday? Now what that means is, am I more moral than I was yesterday? Am I a servant leader? When people look at me, are they seeing a model of higher purpose? Number two, 
in the middle of the curve, in terms of the theory we live by, which is all about roles and positions, expertise and authority, the primary strategy of organizational life is you tell the other person what to do. When there's no courage necessary, usually because of authority, they follow. But when it really matters, they never follow. And it requires a switch from authority and telling to learning and inspiration, which they never learned at business school. Um, and so the question is, instead of telling them, how do you put them into the experience of social excellence, which is what higher purpose creates? So I think of a story of um, a CEO who came to Michigan to our positive business conference, went home and he said to his direct reports, I want this to become a positive company. And they didn't do this, they did this. That is, they had no idea what he was talking about. And his solution was to keep talking at them, which of course didn't work. Realized what he was doing, he went out and bought airplane tickets, he flew them to Ann Arbor, Michigan, they went to Zingerman's chain of uh, restaurants and food companies, which is famous for being purpose-driven and positive. And for two days, they followed people around Zingerman's. When they arrived at my office, I was expecting this, and I got this. When I get back to Texas, I'm going to do this with the truck drivers. I'm going to do this. Where did that fire come from? These are people who couldn't understand it for three months. Now, after two days, they're ready to do it because they were exposed to excellence, which we tend to not believe exists, but it does exist. It's always at the end of the curve, it's rare, but it's everywhere. Rare, but everywhere. Um, the moment they encountered it, their existing paradigm has exploded. They have to think new thoughts. So the question number one is, Am I a leader or a manager? Most people, CEOs on down, are managers, not leaders. Number two, am I able to step out of the managerial role of being an expert, telling people what to do, and can I create real learning, which is real change? Of course, most managers can't lead change. They don't know how. Um, and so the single biggest barrier, in my mind, is people don't believe it's possible because they have learned helplessness in organizations. And the answer is to learn from excellence, which is what higher purpose drives. Bob Quinn and Anjan Thacker, the John E. Simon Professor of Finance at the Olin School of Business at Washington University in St. Louis, recently published a book, The Economics of Higher Purpose, Eight Counterintuitive Steps for Creating a Purpose-Driven Organization. This past winter, both Bob and Ann Jan spoke at the Organizational Higher Purpose Conference hosted by the Bauer Leadership Center at Washington University. Barry Waymiller was also involved, and over the next several episodes of the Everybody Matters podcast, we're going to share some of the insights from that conference. This episode kicks off the series with Bob Quinn and Ann Jan Thacker talking about higher purpose in a socioeconomic context. And here's Bob and Anjan. Um, Anjan and I started our journey a long time ago, and we've attacked higher purpose mathematically. We've gone into the world and interviewed lots of CEOs of purpose-driven companies. Um, we are passionate about the topic. Um, I believe the entire purpose, higher purpose enterprise is counterintuitive. And that leads me to the slide I really want to focus on and talk about what I think is one of the two or three most important things we've learned, not only in doing that research, but since publishing the book, which has only been out two months. Um, but the learning continues. Um, these are the fundamental assumptions of the social sciences. Economics. Man or woman is a rational, self-interested decision maker. Resources are? Scarce. Conflict is inevitable. That's economics, right? This is economics. This is sociology. This is psychology. These are the fundamental assumptions. And we say, what's wrong with those social scientists? 
why are they so sick? And the answer is, they study me. <laughs> and they study you. Now what am I talking about? You're three years old, you're on the playground, someone says, let's play army. You raise your hand and you say, I'll be the private. <laughs> is, is that what you said? I'll be the general, I'll be the mother, I'll be the father, right? You were three years old and you knew it was better to be on top of a hierarchy than on the bottom. From the time you could talk and mother said, because I told you so, and you met the bully at school the first time, you were internalizing this theory. It's called transaction theory, exchange theory. And this theory exists right here just below the conscious mind. It dictates the emergence of all organizational culture. You and I create organizational culture. Culture is a socially constructed phenomenon. It emerges from the quality of interaction you and I have. And if we make these assumptions, we create a transactional culture which reinforces these assumptions. Why are there so many toxic managers? We accept it. It's a fact of life. We don't do much about it. Now, if that's the assumption set right here, and it's dictating the structure of organizations, because culture is more powerful, you know, Peter, Bl Peter Drucker, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It means culture eats you for breakfast and all the problem solving you do. So what happens? In large organizations, in all organizations, we lose communal focus. Competing priorities emerge. HR wants to do this. Sales wants to do this. We hate those folks in that silo. Negative peer pressure in every human group. When someone starts to excel or even suggests initiative, we pull them down. We are very astute at it. It is not gross. It's a powerful dance. Usually it starts with laughter. <laughs> and then it turns to rational argument. And then it turns to moral indignation. But the dance is always being danced. Um, so we begin to micromanage. We constrain interaction. And now we're into problem solving. What do managers do? Eight hours a day. 10 hours a day. They solve problems. What does that mean? That means they're trying to get back to equilibrium. The aspiration is the middle of the curve. It's a reactive stance. Management work is reactive. So we reproduce the past. We keep intensifying the control. We avoid work, particularly the work of confronting conflict. So conflict increases, we get more isolated silos, and we burn money. I once said to a sociologist on campus, my interest is in positive deviance. He instantaneously responded, there is no such thing. By definition, there is no such thing. Deviance is negative. Now he was right. In sociology, if you took 101 in my day, you took social organization. Why is there order in society? Norms, institutions, values. If you were glutton for punishment, you took 102. Social deviance, prostitution, mafia, etc. What was the title of 103? There is no 103. <laughs> this part of the curve does not exist in, so in sociology. It's not a criticism of sociology. It's how the human brain works. We are trained for thousands of years to scan for threat so we can survive. If we're in the room and the CEO does this, does anybody notice? The entire room shifts. Because that's dangerous. CEOs are dangerous. Those eyebrows are dangerous. You've got to be scanning for threat. What does social excellence look like? There's an embrace of higher purpose an emergent shared vision coming from high quality interaction, there's a transformation in peer pressure. 
When everybody on my team is fully engaged and committed, putting everything in, then he expects her to be doing it too. And that's 10 times more powerful than me telling her to do it. So she does it. And when everybody's putting everything in, my job changes. My job became incredibly easier just now. I no longer am a policeman. Who's the policeman? They are. Distributed leadership, almost incomparable to the hierarchical mind that everybody can lead. Everybody can initiate from their point of action. That's impossible. Authentic dialogue. Angie and I concluded in the book the single most important word in our book is authenticity. Because we are not authentic with each other in our hierarchical roles, even in our social roles. We are superficial and transactional. We don't expect authenticity. When we experience it, we're shocked. And yet it is incredibly powerful. It signals trust. It signals that you can be who you really are and I can be who I really am. Um, we can co-create possibility. We can change culture. Most people believe that's nearly impossible. The system self-organizes. The contributions are, are, are uh, um, symbiotic, uh, excuse me, are spontaneous. The learning becomes symbiotic. When you're fully here, and I'm fully here, and we trust each other, I not only share my knowledge, which I've been trained to do all my life, to be an expert and to never be ignorant, otherwise the world would end, I can now share with you my ignorance in a relationship of trust, which is hugely important in the acceleration of learning. The intelligence becomes collective intelligence. I work with thousands of executives. They never know what this means. Intelligence is IQ. You hire the smartest people, put them in a room, now you've got a great organization. Give me the same number of normal people, let me build trust, connection, community, and I will outperform you every time because intelligence is collective. And when we have total trust and assure our ignorance as well as our knowledge, and our learning is symbiotic, everything he says, I build on. I don't say but, I say and. And that opens the door for her to share what she's been hiding for hours because she's afraid, because she's now courageous. The group has a collective mind. And suddenly, we generate resources. Success breeds success. Resources come out of the walls flowing to us because we're now in attraction rather than control. What was the question in the exercise? Inspiration. The managerial mind is not about inspiration. It's about control. Authority, expertise, control. To jump. From being a manager to be a leader is to jump to inspiration. Purpose is at the heart of that inspirational process. We're now in attractive, synergistic dynamics. The moment that I come to believe that there is a right side of the curve, most people do not believe. It's impossible. But science says it's real. But the end of the curve is always rare. We translate that into it's not real. That's not what's happening in my abusive culture. The moment I see it as real, I can ask the question that changes everything. And here's the question. If crisis, now the times that we most frequently see the right side of that curve is when a group or an organization's in crisis. If crisis can create Social excellence without leadership. Can leadership create social excellence without crisis? That's an unaskable question from the middle of the curve. The moment you ask that question, the world changes. Now I'll close with a story. Because this is all about the ability to see and learn from excellence. Because we learn from failure. Researchers say you can't do it any other way. And I disagree. When our paradigm changes, the great payoff is I can begin to learn from excellence. I was fighting with GM executives a couple weeks ago. 
when one guy raised his hand and says, no, no, he's right. And they all snapped their necks. And he says, well, I'm in Mexico. My plant's very big. Five billion dollars we produce each year. We have thousands of suppliers. In 2013, we were getting killed on our own quality. And every time one of our suppliers went below the line, I got on a plane and flew to that company. I knew all the bad suppliers and could describe them to you because they had a lot of commonalities. We were getting killed by our own headquarters. And finally, in panic, I said, I have to do something. And he said, an idea came to me. I said to my people, this year, when we do the award ceremony for the 100 best suppliers, we're not going to bring them in. I said, what? He said, we're going to go to them. Now freeze for just a second. We're going to go to 100 places and make the awards. That's an insane decision in terms of conserving resources. You don't make that decision if you live in the middle of the curve. He said, I went to Mexico, just around the corner, 10,000 10, people, excuse me, 1,000 people, woman plant manager, she walks in like a rock star just walked in. Everybody wants her attention. She said, hey, how's the leg? Your daughter lost last night, didn't she? Hey. And that was just the beginning. And he was stunned. And then he went to the next place and the next place. And he came back and he said, it's not technology. They all have the same quality concepts. They're implementing them with different levels of success. It is not technology. It's leadership. And we're not doing it. We're not leaders. And then he described his team going through a dramatic change. And then said, now this is key. From 2014 to 2017, a 90% increase in quality in all related numbers. If I said to you, I want a 10% increase this year, you're going to start arguing with me. In the middle of the curve, we argue over 2 and 4 and 3 and 7%. Yet in case after case that Angie and I encountered, the story was so similar. Enormous jumps, unimaginable jumps in performance. When we understand purpose, we move into a new realm that other people don't live in. And then you and I engage in exponential learning. And it's not logical. It's logical, emotional, and conscious driven, conscience driven. Not culturally driven. When I'm purpose driven, I bring conscience to culture. That's a key phrase. You won't hear it anywhere else. I bring conscience to culture. Inspiration breathes life into a system. Conscience brings inspiration, which breathes life into a system, and everything changes. Oh. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to follow up on what Bob said with a few observations that he and I have talked about many times. And that is, we see a disturbing picture in society today. Right? There's so much negativity all around us, and that's all we hear. You would think that nobody was doing any good or making any pro-social contributions. So just a few statistics. Since 2010, the estimates are that by 2020, $400 billion in fines will have been paid by banks worldwide. Right? Now, to put this number in perspective, there are 197 countries in the world. There are only 43 that have GDPs that exceed $400 billion. So this is a big number, right? We have uh, spectacular cases of fraud, misrepresentation to customers and governments by corporations. We have a thing that is talked about a lot, growing income inequality. Um, although, and so what, what gets buried in that is all the good news, which is there is research showing that actually the upward mobility of income has been growing. Uh, for over a decade. And, and consumption inequality has actually been following, but a lot of this gets buried by all of the bad news, the negative news. Okay. Some more disturbing statistics. For the first time 
in the history of the Gallup survey, they found that a group, in this case a majority of US millennials, favored socialism over capitalism. Uh, majority of employees express a need for purpose, but they say they don't get it from work. Okay. They spend a lot of time at work. Um, vast majority of employees in US companies feel that the company that they work for doesn't care for them. Right? There was a recent article, a survey that we actually discussed on the PhD committee that stress levels among PhD students in universities, and this is not just business schools, but across the board, are rising exponentially. And when they dig down and ask people, why is it that you're feeling more stressed? It's not because they're working too hard. They all expect to work really hard. It's because they don't see the purpose in their research. You know, I'm being trained to do research, but what value is this adding? Uh, and that is the source of stress, right? Uh, and then just in general, you know, we have all the economic numbers that look great, record unemployment, record stock market, positive wage growth, and yet this negativity is pervasive, right? So the question is, what should we do? And I was presenting a paper a few months back in Europe. And I was talking about, it was a paper on ethics and culture. And one of the, and this was to a group of economists. And so I just wanted to provide that perspective for what I'm about to say. And somebody in the audience said, you know, you Americans, you talk all the time about ethics and values and all this stuff. He says, you know, if you're so worried about people who are engaged in ethical violations, why don't you just lock them all up? and nationalize all, I was talking about banks, and nationalize all the banks. And I said, that is a really bad idea. <laughs> Let me take the next 90 minutes to tell you why, right? So that obviously is not the answer, right? So the simple insight is that higher purpose, as Bob talked about this, higher purpose shapes culture. And we believe that it can change how people in society view corporations, and the entire system that we're a part of. Okay. So this is, to me, not only an issue of social excellence and performance in organizations, I think it's an issue that touches the very core of, of what our system is, how it's designed, and what we do. Okay. So let me just define what we mean by higher purpose. So higher purpose is, it's something that motivates you to engage in business practices that fulfill a need for purpose in life within you that transcend money, promotions, or other purely business goals that you might have as an individual. Leiter defines it as the deepest dimension within us, a central core or essence, where we have a sense of who we are, where we came from, where we're going. It's the quality we choose to shape our lives around purpose as a source of energy and direction. In our book, uh, Bob and I define it for organizations as a reflection of higher intent. It's the most meaningful thing beyond economic transactions and outcomes that an organization has to give. So essentially, it is a pro-social contribution goal, okay? but it's not charity. Okay? And I want to be very careful to make that distinction. So the way that we think about it is you have all your business goals here, profits, uh, market share, shareholder value, all of the things that, that make the system work. And then you have your higher purpose goals, which is the pro-social contribution goal linked to whatever it is that you're doing. So it's linked to the economic services that you provide. It's not just something you do on the side. It, in fact, when you make decisions at this intersection, purpose becomes the arbiter of every decision that you're making. It becomes the lens through which business decisions that are intended to maximize shareholder value are actually viewed. Right? And you know, sometimes I get this reaction, well, this doesn't exist. This intersection doesn't exist. And what Bob and I found, have found in our research is that that's a false statement. We've seen example after example of where companies have operated in this, in this intersection. Okay, and I'll give you a, share a few research findings with you. So this is what we presented in the Harvard Business Review article. And really, the focus of that article, if you see what's on the cover, is how to turn purpose into performance. It was really the impact of organizational higher purpose on organizational performance that we talked about. All right, so 
One of the things that's really interesting is, you know, with best practice sharing, you would think that within industries you would see convergence, right, between the best and the worst, because we can all copy things that work in organizations, and yet what we're finding is the opposite. That in industry after industry, the people who are best in class are actually separating themselves more from the people at the bottom. And one of the interesting reasons for this is that the high performers, the best in class, uh, do a few things differently. Okay? One is they embrace an authentic higher purpose that allows them to tell a story. Right? The story is the purpose that's bigger than uh, economic output. It's bigger than quarterly earnings. They explain the results, so that's the financial performance part of it. That has to be done clearly. Right? Uh, they explain how they got them, which is strategy. But purpose is the why, right? So they explain the why behind the purpose. And this profoundly affects motivation okay, within the firm and in your interactions with other stakeholders. These organizations also understand that there are three ways in which people in organizations are motivated, okay? Um, one is what we call economic exchange. The other is self-improvement. And the third, which relates to purpose, is transcendence, okay? So what is economic exchange? You pay me well, so I'm engaged because I'm well paid, and I'm rewarded for performing well. Okay. The other is improvement. So I focus, the organization focuses on giving me career development, promotion opportunities, and I develop social and intellectual capital, so I'm engaged because I can improve. But the third one, which is not as well understood, is these organizations define an authentic organizational higher purpose. And by the way, Bob touched on this. This part of it is the most difficult. The hardest thing is to be truly authentic. And so here I'm engaged in something which is bigger than myself. Okay? Now what is interesting is that what research has found is that transcendence causes people to define their work as a calling. Right? Gives them discretionary energy. It gives them a cause to give the organization that discretionary energy, energy that they would not otherwise give. Okay? If the connection that these employees have to higher purpose is strong enough, and the purpose is constantly reinforced, what is interesting is employees may even be willing to give up on the first two dimensions of reward, because they're getting more from the third. Okay? And the best in class organizations do all three well. Now, I'll give you a few examples, uh, some empirical evidence that's, that's really striking. So one is uh, a paper that was done by actually a PhD student in organization behavior at Michigan. And what they did is they did a field study of uh, UM Business School call center fundraisers. Now, you've all, I'm sure most of you in, in this room have received calls from fundraisers, right? It's not a call that most people look forward to. I want to begin my day with a call from a fundraiser. It's not how we start, right? So you can imagine being on the other side of that call can't be fun either, right? Because most of the time, people are finding excuses not to talk to you or put the phone down or whatever. So what they did is they studied these call center people, and they did the standard you know, clinical study. So they had a treatment group, they had a control group. Both were given the same script to read. The only difference between the two groups was, so this was a study that was done by Adam Grant and, and some co-authors. And the only difference was that people in the treatment group were allowed to interact with scholarship recipients, okay, who, were, who then shared with them stories of what the scholarship that they received meant to them uh, in their lives. It wasn't a long conversation, five minutes, right? That's it. And then, they went back and studied these two groups over the next month. And they found that this made a huge difference in the performance of the treatment versus the control group. By the way, these two groups, just by the design of the study, prior to this treatment, were pretty similar, right? And so they were spending more time on these phone calls, and they were raising more money. And a month later, the callers who had interacted with the scholarship student spent two to three times as much time on the phone call compared to the control group, and they brought in much more money, so $500 instead of $185, right? So this was a fascinating study. This was published 
you know, if you want to look this up, uh, uh, there's a published version of this, of this, of this paper. And so what, what the authors concluded is that even minimal brief contact with the beneficiaries can help employees to maintain their motivation for a long time after the, after the treatment. All right. Um, there was also a large sample empirical evidence. Earlier this year, there was a paper published by uh, authors at Wharton and, uh, and uh, Harvard on, in organization science where they looked at a sample of 500,000 people across 429 firms, uh, 917 firm year observations from 2006 to 2011. And what they found is that an authentic higher purpose communicated with clarity and commitment from middle management positively impacts both operating performance as well as forward-looking measures of performance like Tobin's Q, stock price, and so on. So the connection in the documented research is very strong. Um, so to conclude, two points. One is a clearly communicated but authentic higher purpose. And authenticity, according to Bob and me, we, in our, in our definition of authenticity, there are two dimensions. One is the usual meaning of authenticity, your accurate fidelity to the truth and all that. But the other dimension is passion. So when a leader is authentically communicating higher purpose, they're communicating it with passion, right? It's not something clinical. Uh, that if you can do that, it significantly and positively impacts effectiveness on almost any dimension you can think of. Profitability, productivity, innovation, customer satisfaction, shareholder value, returns, and so on. And so if organizations that practice higher purpose become more visible in society in terms of their pro-social contributions and people learn about this, then I think we will collectively make a more persuasive case for the system that we're a part of. Thanks again for listening to the Everybody Matters podcast and this Higher Purpose series. If you'd like to find out more about Bob Chapman and Ross's odious book, Everybody Matters, Extraordinary Power of Caring for Your People Like Family, go to everybodymattersbook.com. For updates on the book, this podcast, and for a lot of great content and insight, don't forget to connect with us on the web at barrywaymiller.com, on Twitter at Barry Waymiller, on Facebook and LinkedIn, and check out our blog, trulyhumanleadership.com. I'm Brent Stewart. Thanks again for listening. Stay safe, and don't forget, everybody matters is the only business idea with truly a